This week, I'm speaking with one of my favorite people, Diane Wingert, and we'll be discussing how to create success by outsmarting your brain. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies. Listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers. And finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 258 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller, and I'll be your host every Monday for discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. This week, I'm speaking with one of my favorite people, Diane Wingert, and we'll be discussing how to create success by outsmarting your brain. I had Diane on the podcast twice before in episodes 204 and 214 to discuss mindsets. I strongly suggest you listen to those episodes. I was listening to one of Diane's episodes from her Driven Woman podcast called Make Success a No-Brainer and said to myself, I need to have Diane on to discuss this topic. It basically comes down to the fact that your brain is built to keep you alive and safe. When you're trying something new or live in uncertain times, which we sure are living in, then your brain is not your friend. It will hold you back to keep you safe and alive. I think you'll find this an interesting conversation. However, before we get the episode, let's have a word from our sponsor, Career Pivot. The Career Pivot membership community continues to help the members who are participating in this project grow and thrive. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else figure out what they want to do in the second half of life and then make it happen. Let's hear what David had to say about being part of the community. What I have gotten out of the career pivot community is really two phases. The first phase, I was employed, but then I lost my job for almost seven months. So the career pivot community helped me, frankly, get my head on straight to have the right attitude. It helped me go through a methodical reassessment and a process to find employment, which I did. So that was very helpful, and that's why I continue to stay. The second phase is, since that time, I have since retired. So it's a a slightly different phase, but the Career Pivots community still provides ideas, engagement, frankly, camaraderie, particularly now since we're going through the uh, pandemic process. So it's great to have that feedback and camaraderie. For me also, the bottom line is it's, you're not alone out there. You have other people that give you ideas and perspectives and, frankly, support. So that's why I really enjoy and like the Career Pivot community. I'm recruiting new members to the next group. If you are interested in learning more about the endeavor, please go to careerpivot.com slash community. Now, on to my discussion with Diane Wingert. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I have the real joy of having my dear friend, Diane Winger, back on the podcast to talk about creating success by outsmarting our brain. Welcome to the podcast. I'm always delighted to talk with you, Mark. I got the idea for this when I, um, when I listened to your recent podcast, Make Success a No-Brainer. And you referenced your first earlier podcast, Your Brain is Not Your Friend, which is so true. So why isn't your brain your friend? Well, I think we have to draw the distinction, Mark, between your mind and your brain, because I think we don't really think about it as being two different things, but it clearly is. Your brain is an organ. It takes up about three pounds of your total body weight. It's very watery. 
And it has one job, one job, keep you alive. It keeps you alive by keeping you unconsciously programmed to do what you're accustomed to doing. The thoughts you're accustomed to thinking, the emotions you're accustomed to having, the actions you're accustomed to taking. And the reason why it has to do that, think about this. You're born a little tiny baby, seven or eight pounds. You get a little tiny brain. The brain grows as the head grows, but its capacity to do things doesn't really grow that much. So for a brain to serve you from an eight pound infant to an 80 something year old adult, it has to create shortcuts. These shortcuts are called neural pathways. So the brain is constantly looking for ways to automate things. Now, automation is great. You and I both love technology, work with it every day. But when it comes to your brain, it automates things by making them on autopilot default settings. So you're actually not consciously choosing to think those things. And if you're the kind of person who is used to thinking, trying something new is risky, trying something new is scary, it's safer to stick with what you know. That's not just a personality preference. It is literally something that your brain is now programming you to keep on thinking. But when you get to the stage of life where you've been downsized, phased out, laid off, or choose to leave for whatever the reasons, you've got to get comfortable doing new things. And that's where the problem starts because your brain doesn't want you to. What do we do to our brain to? get around this or to hack this? I, I like the word hack because I think that's really what it comes down to. And I think, I think Mark, it really starts with understanding how the human brain actually works and how the mind works with it. As I said, the brain is just an organ, but it is a calorie hog. It consumes about 25% of the calories that your entire being needs to run itself every day. So it's always looking for shortcuts and it's going to want you to keep on thinking the same old thoughts. And if you're a risk averse person, getting yourself to do something new is going to be hard. I recommend actually trying to outsmart the brain by working things in reverse. Here's how we normally do it. We normally think, all right, I need to try this new thing. I need to do this new thing. I need to learn this new thing, but I've never done this before. Well, most people, when they've never done something before, think this is going to be hard. I might not do it very well. What if I can't really learn this? What if I'm too old? What if it's just beyond my reach? What if I can't catch up? And once we start thinking those thoughts, which your brain is actually just trying to keep you safe by feeding you those thoughts. The problem is that We have to learn new things. So I say, instead of letting your brain lead by giving you all that good advice, like, oh, you know, you might not want to start that new business because it could fail, or you might not want to learn that new skill because aren't you a little old for this? Your brain is actually trying to help keep you safe because safe means alive. What we actually have to do is go ahead of the brain and start to work in reverse. And here's what I mean exactly. Instead of thinking, all right, here, I'm going to try to learn this new skill, let's say coding, for example, or email marketing or anything having to do with a new business. We have all these things we need to learn. We've got a brain that's telling us, oh, that's like the worst idea you ever had. You're certainly going to fail. You're too old. It's too late. It's too hard, blah, 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 blah. What if we go ahead and decide just simply decide, I will succeed. Instead of waiting for circumstances to prove that to us, what if we actually decide I'm going to be successful at that? Or if that just feels just too out of reach, how about I will succeed if I keep trying? I don't know very many people who wouldn't be able to sign off on that thought. Now, some people would say, I'm, don't, I'm going to succeed. My success is inevitable. That's like, now, come on. I, I, I can't get myself to believe that. Okay, I got you. No problem. How about this? I will learn if I don't quit. 
almost everyone would agree to that. So what if instead of just working with the thoughts that your brain serves up to you, which by the way, are the thoughts that are on autopilot default settings because you've thought them before. So your brain is just trying to make life easier for you and consume fewer calories by reminding you of the thoughts that you already have so much practice thinking. But those thoughts will not help you change, will not help you learn, will not help you grow, and will never serve you to try something new. So you got to outsmart your brain by going to the point where you have already succeeded in your mind, in your imagination, imagining yourself actually having that successful encore career, getting the job, raising your rates, starting the new venture, whatever it is, imagine it in your mind in as much detail as you possibly can. And then ask yourself, what will I be thinking once I'm there? What will I be thinking about what I'm doing once I have already succeeded at it? I promise you, if you start from that point and then start to work backwards to where you are now, your mind is not going to be filled with what ifs and you know the possibility of failure. You will literally be programming yourself to think from the mindset and perspective of someone who's succeeding at the very thing you're terrified to start with now. It really works. When I listen to your podcast and the one, the one area I really remember was the whole idea of limiting beliefs. And it kind of brought me back to, uh, I've traveled all over the world. Um, I've worked in 40 different countries. I feel safe in just about every city in the world, but the one I grew up in around New York. Mm. Why? Because I still have the program that my mother put in my head that New York City was so dangerous. And those beliefs and thoughts, I'm, they're still chunking around in my brain. I'm glad you're bringing this up, Mark, because it's why people get PTSD. When we encounter a situation that our brain associates with a past experience, particularly a negative one, a painful one, a scary one, a traumatic one, because our brain's only job is to keep us alive. You could also say our brain's only job is to keep us safe. It triggers memories. It triggers associations. It triggers flashbacks, if you will, to keep us safe. And it's kind of like, you know, we will give the example you try to keep a kid from running out in the street or touching a hot stove or going near the electrical outlet with a fork or whatever. But your brain takes over for you from a very young age. And what's interesting about this is that. You don't even have to have experience, like real, actual, embodied experience. All you have to have is a memory of someone telling you something from an early age and stage for that to sink deep roots in your brain. These neural pathways are especially powerful when they're created in childhood. I often say a human being is born with a brain that is like an empty field of fertile soil. There's nothing already planted there, so it's wide open space. In the first seven years of life, we get a lot of messages from our parents, primarily grandparents, older siblings, as we get a little bit older, teachers, you know, all sorts of other adults in our life. And because we haven't already got a lot of experience thinking our own thoughts, making our own memories, having our own life experiences, we just absorb everything that is said to us. And I want to make this point, everything that is said about us. And because there isn't a lot of other seeds planted in that soil yet, those roots go deep those neural pathways often form the basis of beliefs we carry about ourselves for the rest of our lives. If you have ever heard a brilliant person call themselves stupid when they make a simple mistake, or 
some people who are very attractive and yet they are completely convinced that they're ugly. Almost all of us have some of these lingering beliefs from childhood where in one way, shape, or form, we think we're not enough. We're not smart enough. We're not attractive enough. We're not sexy enough. We're not athletic enough. We're not social enough. We're not confident enough, whatever it is. And in almost every case, Mark, you can trace those beliefs all the way back to early childhood, sometimes because we were bullied. And sometimes parents think they're motivating a child to try harder by calling them stupid. There are many cultures around the world that by American standards would be considered verbally abusive as a motivational strategy. My husband's German. My son's girlfriend is Chinese. We've had a lot of family conversations around how different parenting styles around the world try to motivate kids. And then you can end up having a person who is legitimately brilliant, highly educated, extremely successful, but their default setting is I'm dumb and I'm just fooling all these people. This is some powerful stuff. Talk about limiting beliefs. Quick interruption. If you are enjoying this podcast, please rate it and review it on whatever podcast player you are using. And more importantly, would you mind telling a friend? Thanks. And back to the podcast episode. I know I grew up in a very dysfunctional family and after it was only after a lot of therapy did I start to blossom because I believed I was I wasn't good enough. I I was a failure um, mm-hmm. in so many ways, and so that's why I really, when I was listening to your podcast, the fact that a lot of these thoughts are totally unconscious. Almost always, as a matter of fact, especially the ones that go back to childhood. And I want to make this point because we talk about thoughts and we talk about beliefs. There actually is no difference. Beliefs are really just thoughts that we've had a lot of practice thinking. And we have been thinking them for so long that we honestly can't even remember a time when we weren't thinking them. And that's a clue to a limiting belief that is rooted in childhood. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I've always thought of myself as stupid or ugly or slow or whatever. So that must be, it must be true because I'm not trying to think it. I I, I don't want to think it. It's very painful for me to think it, but I keep on thinking it. So that must be because it's true, right? No. It's because you started thinking it at an early stage in life. And then to save space, your brain made a neural pathway. And now it just shows up automatically. And because your brain's only job is to keep you alive by keeping you safe, it literally thinks, well, if you're alive now, then obviously whatever we're doing is working. So if you keep on thinking these thoughts, you'll keep being safe and alive. I like to say your brain is a lazy mofo and that's because it's a calorie hog, but it literally saves calories, saves energy and doesn't have to work so hard if you keep thinking the same thoughts you're thinking. So we fast forward from that little kid who thinks they're going to be a failure into a grown-up man or woman who has tremendous life experience, professional experience, all the credentials, but still has that persistent thought that they're not enough, that they don't have what it takes. Who would hire me? There's plenty of people and better. And even if I do get the job, I was either lucky or I pulled the wool over their eyes. So even when you get what you want, you're not able to fully receive it and appreciate it and enjoy it. That's how pervasive these things are. I want to reference a book that I really recommend called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. It was published about 15 years ago, still one of my favorites, and I recommend it all the time. In The Big Leap, the author Gay Hendricks says that almost all of us from childhood 
have several different categories of limiting beliefs. The number one that nearly everyone has, he calls the fundamental flaw. The fundamental flaw is that almost every human thinks there's something wrong with me. Like there's something wrong with me. It's I'm not smart enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not confident enough. I I don't have a good enough personality. I'm not athletic enough. I, I don't have something that is necessary in order to be healthy, happy, and successful. Isn't it astonishing that nearly every person has this limiting belief that they're not an, I mean, no wonder there are billions of dollars being made selling us everything from wrinkle creams to get rich quick schemes, because we all seem to be suffering from this belief that who we are is not enough. It's not okay. It's interesting. I, uh, I'm one of my favorite books is a book called positive intelligence by Shazad Sharmin. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the, there are two sides of the brain. There's the why side, and then there's the saboteur side. Mm. And he lists about 10 saboteurs of which the number one is for almost everyone is the judge. You're yes. not good enough. And the idea is to start you, you number one, he asks you to name your saboteurs mm-hmm. and two, he's it's the idea is to learn to spot those thoughts Yes, as they pop up. And if you can spot them, Oh, that's the judge speaking. You can turn it off. Mm-hmm. Right. I agree. It, you have to identify it first, right? You have to identify it. And once you identify it, you then can say, Oh, that's such as judge speaking or the hypervigilant speaking or the, you know, the, uh, and the idea is to be able to spot it. It's not what I want to believe. So let's turn that off. Mm-hmm. You, you discussed some stuff like that in you did in the podcast. Yeah. There's so many different, I think, fun techniques to counteract this. And there are a lot of different philosophies about how how to do it. Some people will say, whenever you spot a negative thought popping up in your mind, something that uh, puts you down, criticizes you, tells you you're not enough, just whack it like whack-a-mole, just mentally whack it over the head and say, you know, you're, you're, you have no place here. Shut up. Then there are other people that say, you know, you don't have to be aggressive with these things. You can just think of them as love messages from your brain. Your brain is just trying to keep you safe. Your brain doesn't mean you any harm. Your brain is just reminding you of these messages so that you won't do too much and disappoint yourself. So you don't, you don't have to be aggressive with them. You can just say, okay, thank you. And then ignore them. I I have a bit of an imagination. So I have all kinds of different characters. And when I'm working with clients on this issue, I'll say, well, what's a character that you would like? You could be an inner city school teacher where you just need to keep order in the class. So when people are creating a ruckus in the back of the room, you can say, I'm you know, you're going to the principal's office, you need to sit down, I'm calling your mama, you know, like whatever, you can interact with them that way. I sometimes think that my mind needs a bouncer. I know exactly what he looks like, what his uniform looks like, how tall he is, his size, and he guards my mind. Because whenever I'm about to do something new, something scary, something that I haven't yet proven to myself that I'm capable of, that's when these thoughts are really going to gang up on you and bully you and try to hold you back. So I assign the bouncer. And sometimes I'm just very neutral. And I just imagine that I'm doing a press conference and all the reporters want to ask me questions I'm not willing to answer. And I say, yep, get to you. I'll get to you too. Yes. Duly noted. Yes. Thank you. But I'm not listening to any of them. So I think what all of these things have in common is the idea that you do not have to be subject to your negative self-talk, you can actually separate yourself from it, get a little bit of emotional distance from it, and recognize that you are not your thoughts. 
And uh, let's take it to the next level. All thoughts are optional. And even though these happen to be the thoughts that my brain is serving up on autopilot, that's only because I have a lot of experience thinking them. So when my brain tells me you're going to fall on your face, that's a terrible idea. No one wants this. Sometimes I'll say, you know, that might be so. But what if they do? What would that look like? If my brain is telling me you're not enough, that's possible. But what if I am? Then what? And just being able to sort of unhook yourself from that shame spiral that is almost the inevitable consequence of thinking those thoughts. We just think them. We don't even realize that we could stop them. We could argue with them. We could talk back to them. We could put them in the trunk of the car and drive. I mean, we could do whatever we want with them. But when you do not realize that that is an option, you will never exercise that option. And one of my favorite things that I may have mentioned in that podcast interview was a free tool that is available on both Apple and Android phones. It is an app called Think Up. Think Up is actually quite brilliant. There's a paid variety. You do not need to pay for it. The free version is quite enough. Here's what's brilliant about it. Affirmations are nothing new, Mark. You and I have both heard about affirmations probably since the 70s. But what's new about doing them this way is you choose the affirmations that you want to tell yourself. There's a lot of suggestions right in the app. And then you record them in your own voice. Most affirmation apps, you just read the words or they'll say, um, you listen You listen to someone else reading them. But the reason why I recommend this one and why I think it's powerful is that it is the same voice that is talking smack to you now. So you're already listening to your own voice. You're already listening to your own voice telling you, you're a dum-dum, you're a loser, nobody wants this, no one's going to hire you, this is a terrible idea, you're going to fall on your face. You're already used to that voice talking to you in that way. So what we're doing with the ThinkUp app is changing the script. And I ask my clients to just have this app playing the affirmations in the background in the morning when you're getting ready and in the evening when you're winding down because those times of day, your brain is in a more relaxed state. You're not on alert yet. You're, you're kind of warming up and slowing down. So you're more receptive to influence, which is why nobody should ever grab their smartphone and get on social media in the minute they wake up or when they're trying to go to sleep, bad idea. But allowing yourself to start getting familiar and comfortable with thinking better thoughts about yourself. What's fascinating about this is at first you will notice the rebuttal. You know, you might be listening to the affirmation say, there's no reason you can't succeed with this. Keep going. Don't quit. You have everything you need to succeed. Your success is inevitable. People need to hear what you have to say, whatever it is. And as soon as you start listening to it, because you're used to thinking and talking to yourself as loser, you know, dummy, whatever, your brain will rebut because it doesn't want to do the hard work of letting go and creating new neural pathways. I think of it this way, like you literally laying a new layer of asphalt on a cracked old pothole filled street, the old street will still be there. But if you keep laying down the new asphalt, the new thoughts, and you continue to practice thinking them, eventually with practice, your brain will realize it's actually easier to adopt the new thoughts, create a new neural pathway and put them on autopilot. It does happen if you don't give up, like almost everything. Why this is so interesting to me, I just had a call a couple of days ago with a woman, early 50s, incredible credentials. And she been looking for a job for a year and a half, getting ghosted, getting interviews, 
And uh, I call it the uh, MSU disorder. She was suffering from make stuff up. Mm. Um, and all these negative self thoughts pop up because the reality is she didn't know why things were happening the way they were. And that just brings in so much self doubt. And you have to be able to break that cycle. You're so right. Yeah. You have to break the cycle because otherwise you, you're, you're going to die. I mean, it's, um, and so therefore it's finding methods to, I like to say, reframe your thoughts, Mm -hmm. right. Um, put a different frame on what you need, because I said, I got a ton of crap from my childhood that, I mean, give me an idea. I grew up in a highly intelligent family. My, both my parents had IQs of 140. I graduated high school. I could barely read hmm. because I was very learning disabled and hmm. we they didn't know about stuff like that. So you kind of, you know, you end up with all this stuff that even carries me. I'm 65 years old and I still have those thoughts. It's true. I think it's important that everybody listening understands that I will be the last person to leave anyone with the impression that you will reach a point where you'll never have a negative thought about yourself again. We're the same age. I have been working on my mindset, my brain, therapy, spiritual path, coaching for many years, very dysfunctional family as well. And you don't even have to have a dysfunctional family to have limiting beliefs. Nearly everyone has them. But I think it's important to realize that that it, it just becomes a regular part of your self-care, like flossing and getting a colonoscopy every 10 years. Like instead of thinking, I know I'm due for one now, that's why it's on my mind. Um, but instead of thinking that somehow you're going to reach the mental health promised land where you're only going to think good things about yourself, you won't have any more self-doubt, you will have confidence and self-assurance, and you will always expect success. I think people who never think anything negatively about themselves are usually narcissists and sociopaths. So that's not actually the goal here, but to recognize that everybody has negative self-talk, everybody, and it doesn't have to stop you if you understand that it is part of the old programming that you grew up with, whatever kind of childhood you had. We all have memories of being told something negative about us. You were wearing glasses. They called you four eyes. You had buck teeth. So they called you names for that. Every Everybody's been bullied. Everyone has human parents who were inadequate in some way, shape, or form. And so I think what also goes with this is recognizing two other things. One, even if you're really diligent about rewiring your self-talk, and I highly recommend everyone does it, there will be times that if you're experiencing new trauma, new setbacks, new losses, where you will temporarily regress back to a time when you weren't thinking such good thoughts about yourself, because that's just the nature of trauma. And that's how it affects the mind and brain. Doesn't mean that this doesn't work or that it's temporary or that it wears off. It just means when you have new trauma loss or you know, traumatic experiences, you will experience a temporary setback. So you give yourself some grace and you continue doing what you're doing because it does come back. But I think there's one other thing that we really should mention, and that is this. A lot of people can get behind the understanding that you can actually choose your thoughts. You don't just have to keep dealing with the old crappy recycled thoughts from 50 years ago, that you can actually start programming yourself to think differently about yourself, about the world around you, about your possibilities, about your potential, about all of these things. And that there are some simple, realistic, sustainable ways to do that, including some of the things we've talked about today. But I think there's also another 
missing piece that I don't often hear people talk about. You also have to believe you deserve it. And I think if we are just telling ourselves to think better thoughts without also making the decision to believe that we deserve to feel better about ourselves, that we actually deserve to think those better thoughts, that we genuinely deserve to have the success that seems to be escaping us, I don't think it can just work in a vacuum. Otherwise, I think what we're talking about is what used to be called power of positive thinking, where you're just kind of like forcing a lot of positivity messages into your brain. If you do not make a conscious choice to say, I deserve this, and keep on practicing thinking that thought, it's going to be hard to be consistent. It's going to be hard to deal with those setbacks. And it's going to be hard to stay on the path over time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think we've we've just lived through two years of trauma. Indeed. I guarantee you most of the audience here has gone through some something that has set them back. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, now is the time to start working on that. That's why I wanted to bring you on to the podcast, because I think this is a very powerful message at a very crucial time. We got to get our stuff together. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I would also say that the reason why believing that you deserve it is so important is that I think our culture here, I speak for Western culture, most of us have been socialized to wait for permission for things. We have been culturally conditioned from an early age. You do not speak out of turn. You raise your hand. You don't need, you can't even go to the bathroom unless you're excused. We wait for the bell. We wait for the meeting to end. Like we apply for a job and we wait to be told if we're chosen. And so in so many ways, our culture conditions us to wait for permission. But when you take charge of your own financial future and your career destiny, and you start thinking in terms of, this is what I want to create. These are the outcomes I want to attract. This is the role I want to play. This is the business I want to shape. You have to start thinking very intentionally about signing your own permission slip. And especially as we get older, Mark, there are fewer and fewer people who want to give us permission to do the things that we want to do and think the things that we want to think and have the things that we want to have. So that's one of the other things I think goes with this is making the decision to sign your own permission slip and say, even if nobody else agrees, this is what I choose to think. These are decisions I choose to make. And I actually do not need to wait for anyone else to press go. It's up to me. It's an inside job. I think that's a great place to end this podcast on a positive note. Diane, if someone wanted to reach out and contact you and listen to your podcast and read your blog, how might they do that? I would like if you would check out the Driven Woman podcast. It is marketed to women who are falling short of their goals, but I do understand a lot of men, including our dear host, our listeners. You can connect with me on Instagram at Coach Diane Wingert, and everything else related to me and what I do can be found on my website at Diane Wingert Coaching. So, Diane, this has been really powerful. Thank you very much for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. Mark, it's been my pleasure. I love my discussions with Diane. We chatted for probably another 30 minutes after we finished recording the session. Hopefully you can tell this is a topic that is near and dear to me. I have focused a lot on my own mental health in the second half of life, and this pandemic has not made it any easier. Take a moment, go to careerpivot.com, sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You'll get a weekly update on this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com.
com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode 258. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. In fact, this podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. I hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career Podcast.